The Bank of Canada lowered its prime interest rate for the fourth straight time. The Liberals will tell you this is a great and wonderful thing. I'm here to tell you what the reality of it is. Welcome to the Canadian Shield. My name is Sterling. I'm your host. As mentioned in the intro, the Bank of Canada lowered its prime interest rate by a half a percentage point. They'll, the Liberals will come out and try to tell you that this is a good thing and that it's an indication that their plan is working. It's not an indication that their plan is working. In fact, it's an indication that the shiny veneer that's on top of the situation, that the system is very close to, to actually tip, it's like near its tipping point. And I can show you, based on many of the things that the uh, bank, the governor of the Bank of Canada says, which we'll hear in a minute, but I just would like to point out that his opening statement indicates to me that he's playing, he's speaking for a politician, that somebody's talking through him. I'm going to let you hear some of it, and then I will, uh, I will break it to go slowly for those of you that might not necessarily understand the jargon or what he's not saying. Today we lowered the policy rate by 50 basis points. This is our fourth consecutive decrease since June and brings our policy rate to three and three quarters percent. Inflation has come down significantly from 2.7% in June to 1.6% in September. Price pressures are no longer broad based and both measures, both our measures of core inflation are now below two and a half percent. First of all, when he says broad-based, what he means is inflation is not on everything. Inflation is only on some things, mostly food and housing. But he'll get into that. What you need to hear was that he said in September, the interest, the, uh, interest rate, excuse me, the inflation rate was 1.6. Now, I remember in August, I said that if you can get, if you stop spending the inflation rate in September, will be the one that sort of makes them go bananas. 1.6 has got them freaking out. They are unhappy about that. And if you stop spending, they will lose their minds even more. I mentioned that getting the um, inflationary rate well below two only harms the banks. It doesn't harm the individual person. That is why they've gone a half a percentage point because they're very concerned that nobody is spending any money. And honestly, what they don't want to admit is that nobody has any money to spend, which we'll show you here in a, in a second as he says more and more and sort of lets the, you know, shows his hand. Before I show you this next clip, I, I just forgot to say, um, when he says this is our four straight lowering of the uh, interest rate, he says that because the pol his politician friends want him to say that. Otherwise, why would he care? It's not like we're keeping track of the, uh, there's, if there's not a chart running or a statistics, we're not looking at a graph. We need to know what the number is, which was at five, from zero to five, and now they want you to be happy that it's at 3.75. Household spending and business investment have picked up this year, but remain soft. This softness has helped take the remaining steam out of inflation. This softness has helped take the remaining steam out of inflation which is just bank code for nobody's spending any money and nobody's investing any money. So now people that have product are desperate to get rid of it and they're lowering their prices in an effort to get you to buy it. So now we come back to what the conservatives have been saying the whole time. The more money you have, the more things cost. The less money there is, the less things cost. And we can hear it right now, right? Just because he says softer, what he means is, People stopped buying so much that inflation dropped to 1.6. Now, if you continue to stop buying, if you can go through Christmas without buying, inflation will drop to one. And Tiff Macklin and McCarney, those guys will just lose their mind. Kearney, Mark Kearney, those guys will just snap because that, in, that inflation is their profit margin. And he's going to try to predict for you what the future will hold or as it pertains to the economy, because they've been just so good at it up to now. The upward pressure from shelter and other services ex is expected to gradually diminish. Let me expand on what we're seeing in the economy and how that played into our deliberations. After stalling in the second half of last year, the economy grew by about 2% in the first half of this year, and we expect growth of about one and three quarters percent in the second half. The economy remains in excess supply 
and the labor market is soft. The unemployment rate was 6.5% in September. Job layoffs have remained modest, but business hiring has been weak. So last year in the second half, people were laying off, people were getting fired, and that turned the economy stagnant. Remember when they talk about growth, when they talk about these numbers, they are always comparing it against a time prior to that. Now, up until 2021, the time was always 12, uh, 2012. Now they are comparing it against a 12-month. So when he says there was a small growth in the, in the a 2% growth in the first half of the year, he means compared to last year, not compared to 2019. And when he says the inflationary rate was 1.6, he doesn't mean compared to 2019 or 2017. Those are not what we'll call the 100 or the, or the zero, depending on who's, which dragon you prefer. Those are against last year, 1.6. They may even be against last month. I didn't look that closely into it because what I heard told me everything I needed to know and what I'm going to tell you what you need to know. But I don't want you to get into your mind that the everything is bouncing back because then he just said, that even though layoffs are less, nobody's hiring, and the inflation, the unemployment rate is six, which is very high, right? Six is a very high. That means one, six out of every 100 people don't, are not working, but they are drawing unemployment. Remember, those numbers are not indicative of who might be in school. Then Those numbers are not indicative of people who might be on social assistance or on disability or any of that. It's not the number of people that are not working in the country. It's the number of people that are drawing unemployment benefits because their job was like it ended whether they worked all summer and then they took unemployment to go back to school or the company closed or their job was outsourced to a computer whatever that happens to be so we know that six percent of people that have been working are now at least in the last 90 days unemployed we also know that nobody's hiring we also know that there's no business investment so here we see the destruction of the middle class right because small businesses is being trashed now, he'll say words like softened and growth, but between me and you, what those numbers mean are nobody's spending, nobody's making investments, and the only indication that the economy is, is getting stronger, which I told you in May, I did a, a report on it, because the April numbers were released and they were all like, oh, it's a little bit of a growth. There's a lot of growth based on the fact that the government is spending money on schools, hospitals, or not hospitals, but uh, health care, and... The, the government had to pay out a lot of money to the PSAC, the uh, sort of the uh, a union that went on strike last year, and now they're upset because they have to work three days a week. So all of those numbers will impact what's called the overall economy or the GDP because it's talking about how much numbers are, how much money is being moved around. We also know that they will go into the House of Commons and say, "Oh, look." Uh, job wages have outpaced the cost of living. So those people are getting paid more money. That is also something that they're trying to reflect in the 2%. That, however, is what's an artificial, what we call an artificial inflation and a shiny veneer. It's not under what's underneath that we're talking about. And as we can see, the 1.6 inflation, which works more to our side than works more to the people that have not than to those that have. That's something that indicates people are not buying and the people that are that do have the, the products to sell are selling them at less profit so they can just get them out of the door so they can just get rid of them. However, when he said they're not broad based, remember that all he's talking about primarily is consumer goods, which the food and the housing, I mean, the housing in some parts of this country have still gone up another 12%. And food is 35% higher than it was in 2019. So if he says to you, it's gone down a little bit in the last couple of months, it doesn't mean anything compared to where it was in 2019. We're still 30% above where we were. So the inflationary rate, the elevated prices are 30% in food and housing. And what do we need mostly? as humans, or even if we just call ourselves mammals, food and shelter. But of course, the things that we need by our government are priced through the roof. Now you'll hear him say the famous words that people in his position love to say forecast, which is just an educated guess. And 
you can't put that much weight in it because when they tried to forecast that there wouldn't be inflation when the government was printing money like a madman, look at the mess it's gotten us into in such a short span. Looking ahead, GDP growth is forecast to gradually strengthen to around 2% in 2025 and 22 and a quarter percent in 2026. This forecast largely re reflects the net effect of a gradual pickup in consumer spending per person and slower population growth. Again, just exactly what the conservatives have been telling you the whole time. There's too many people coming into the system and there's not enough people, no, there's too, not enough money to go around. He's projecting that next year in 2025, the GDP will grow a little bit and 2026 will grow slightly a little bit after that based on the idea that there was less people coming into the country. However, he can't tell you any more than he can tell you if it's going, you know, what the lottery numbers are going to be. It's a projection. It's a forecast based on the current set of numbers and on the current set of parameters that the government has around population. But we all know that the government is looking for many, many different shifty ways to bring people into the country because they seem to want to just destroy the economy. They just want to break it. They just want to project onto you that if you say anything about it, you're a bad human being. But in the end, every policy that they make is designed, is, is harming the overall economy. You can hear it when he just said it, right? Population growth. The more people, too many people, not enough jobs, that makes for a horrible economy. The decline in inflation in recent months reflects the combined effects of lower global oil prices, slightly lower shelter price inflation in Canada, and lower prices for many consumer goods like cars and clothes. Excess supply in the economy is absorbed. Okay, so if you were listening closely to there, you will hear that fuel prices is driving part of the inflation because fuel prices have come down. So... When we say that putting a carbon tax on fuel is bad for the economy, we can see how the bank factors in the cost of fuel onto the overall economy. We can see how the bank and inflation are both imp impacted by the price of fuel. And by adding a tax to the fuel, you are in fact affecting both the economy and inflation. Then he said the overall uh, inflation for it was, it was a really particular way that he said that the overall inflation for housing is less than normal. It's not that it hasn't gone high. Like I said, in some parts of the country, it's 10, 12%. And even the small one, the small parts of the country, it's like seven or 8%. And I'm not talking to you about the major cities. I'm talking like Labrador, it's 7%. I don't understand that, but that's just because the bankers don't care, right? They're just driving up the price. And if you can't pay it, then you're on the street. It's that simple. There's no ethics involved in it, right? That's a different video, I suspect. Then he said consumer prices have come down. Now, the only part of the food bill that's going to lower for me and you will be the junk food. The, the rest of it is all going to stay inflated because they're making it hand over fist. But the people making food that nobody needs, they are going to be screaming out of their mind. And if you look in your flyers, you'll see that potato chips have come down, cookies are coming down, things of that nature, that all of that stuff, soda pop, all of that stuff is starting to going to start to become less and less expensive because they're worried that nobody's buying it, which is why the inflation rate is coming even lower. Now, when I tell you that it comes to 1.6, that's good for you and bad for them. That's based on the fact that no one is buying these things. Nobody's buying cars and clothes, and makeup and all of the things that are the West is known for. Nobody now has the money for it. They're all just keeping that to themselves. Now I suspect that there's still, you know, the basics for makeup being sold, but I would imagine that there's a lot of women out there that are only putting on the heavy stuff for the for the strong nights out and they're just doing eyeliner and lip gloss when they go to work, assuming that that stuff is permissible where they work. So when you hear him talk that the excess supply has to be absorbed, what he means by that is there's a lot of stuff out there and if people, if there's a million of something and nobody's buying it, they'll sell it to you really inexpensively. If there's one of something and everybody wants it, then it goes really high, which of course is exactly what the conservatives have been telling you the whole time about the massive money printing. So you can see how it all comes full circle to having horrible economic policy five years ago having terrible, horrible economic policy. 
I mean, the government would have been better off to just give everybody food stores and let them sit tight for the pandemic than the way that they handled it. Anyway, that's a different video as well, I suppose. Now I come to his wish list, and I've heard in the House of Commons today that they've tried to forgive a bunch of loans for small, small to medium businesses because they realize that it's destroying the economy. They should have listened to people when they had an opportunity, and now what they're doing is not enough. It's too little, too late. That's where we're at with that. So I want you to hear uh, the, what the governor of the bank has to say in his projections. The biggest downside risk to inflation is that it could take longer than anticipated for household spending and business investment to pick up. On the upside, lower interest rates could fuel a stronger rebound in housing activity or wage growth could remain elevated relative to productivity. On the upside, maybe it'll bring down, maybe people will start to buy houses or people will still be able to maintain their jobs and get overpaid for what they're doing, right? Relative to productivity, as you heard him say. The individual getting paid is something that the market should have taken care of. They should not have allowed for housing to get this expensive. The secret to having a good economy, the secret to having a strong economy is to keep the basics affordable. That's why the Americans get away with it. They didn't, you didn't see them pushing up the cost of housing because then they would know that people have less money to spend on other things. Now, the greed that was shown through by the, by the landowners in their, in their desire to you know, get out as much money as they could is starting to backfire because on those projections of the, all the condominiums they crammed in all of these high-density areas the bank had lent them over larger amounts of money. I mean, the, I heard Freeland say that now you can tell the bank that you want to build a laneway house and they will not only lend you money against what you, the property that you own, they're going to lend you money against the projection of what that property is going to earn, even though it hasn't been built yet, up to $2 million. And every time those people default on those loans, if they are covered by the Canadian Housing Mortgage Authority, the taxpayer picks up the bill, but that's a different video as well. I don't want the, the economy being so intertwined. What I want you to hear is that he is hoping that the housing market will start to rebound. And that is one of the real reasons why the housing, the 3.5, 3.75 happened today, because nobody is buying these rickety little tiny little shoe boxes for a million and a half dollars where they can't even raise a family, where they can't even own a car, but he wants these things and who can blame them. And this of course is now starting to manifest in the upper halls of the elites. They're starting to lose a lot of money or the taxpayer is starting to funnel a lot of money through the Canadian housing authority into the banks that are because their people are defaulting on the mortgages and on the loans that they had around these things, which is why they needed to push it to 30 years. Because by pushing it to 30 years, they get five more years of interest out of you. And it gives you a little bit of longer time, a little bit, it can, you know, lay out the number a little bit smaller. The real thing that they don't want to tell you is that the housing is too expensive. And I'll say it once, I'll say it, I'll say it again. In a country that's 94% covered in a renewable resource that we can plant in the ground and it will grow again in a couple of years. Housing should be dirt cheap. It should be well built and very inexpensive, as as should food. And then you can start worrying about spending money left, right, and center. Of course, what I'm describing doesn't create two classes of people. It creates a middle class, a middle class where people are making money and selling things and have a, a, the affordability to be able to shop and to save and to create a, a middle class economy. What many of these liberals, they, you know, they're exactly the opposite of what the word liberal is, if I'm honest with you, want to do is destroy the middle class. That's why all of their policies, or at least it appears that way. That's why many of their policies are harming the economy. And by doing so, you take away the purchasing power and the spending power of the people that are, that are working but are not part of the upper crust elite class, the 1%. Now we come into the press questions, and the first question that he was asked is the only one that I'll cover because the rest of them were sort of, uh, they were repeats. However, the first question, which I believe was delivered by Reuters, was very to the point and 
what I want you to understand is the response that he says would make Freeland blush. I mean, there's, it's so meandering and so it, it doesn't even answer the question that he's asked. However, it does give you and I a lot of information that is sort of under that shiny veneer that I mentioned to you. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Paul. Uh, good morning, Governor. Uh, wanted to ask you that how fast do you think that the monetary policy, the policy rate should move back to a, uh, to a place where it is no more restrictive? Because clearly a restrictive monetary policy is still taking a toll on the economy. Now, for those of you that might not have understood what he meant, no more restrictive, what he means is no longer restrictive. Currently, even at 3.75, it is a restrictive monetary policy for investment. It's a restrictive monetary policy for business investment or housing investment. Anybody trying to put large sums of money at that kind of percentage point is going to be telling themselves, mm, yeah, I'm not so sure. And that's what the nature of the question is. So he wants to know how long until we can get this thing back down to one or zero where it was when all of this chaos and madness started with the liberal government printing too much money. Excess supply. Look, I mean, since we began cutting rates in June, we've, we've been very clear about the direction. We've also been clear we're going to take our decisions one meeting at a time based on the best available information. So today we decided to cut the, the policy rate by 50 basis points, uh, so we took a bigger step. And that really reflected the fact that the information we've received in the last two months suggested it was appropriate to take a bigger step. So what, you know, what is that information that we particularly focused on? I mean, first, obviously, inflation. Headline inflation has come down significantly. Yes, part of that is global oil prices. You saw a big decline, particularly in gasoline prices. Uh, and, and that can be volatile. But you know, if you look beyond that, uh, you know, there are some more fundamental factors. Core inflation has continued to gradually ease largely as we expected. Um, if you look at shelter price inflation, it's still elevated, but it has started to come off. And that has increased our confidence that that you know that will gradually continue to ease uh, we've still got excess supply in the economy labor market's still soft uh, you are seeing you know, you know the, the excess supply in the economy is pulling putting downward pressure on many goods uh, and services prices you're seeing that particularly in consumer goods prices <clears throat> which um, <laughs> ha have been quite soft and if you look at expected inflation our own surveys of inflation perceptions um, consumer and businesses expectations of inflation have have come down or are now nearing normal if you look at the economy is growing, uh, but the economy continues to be in excess supply. The labor market is soft. Our growth forecast hasn't changed a great deal, uh, but we have revised down near-term growth uh, a little. So you, you put all that together, uh, to us that suggested it was appropriate to take a bigger step today, so that's what we did. We've also indicated that um, if the economy continues to evolve uh, broadly in line with our forecast, uh, we do anticipate further cuts in our policy rate. And as I said, we're going to continue to take those one at a time based on the best available information. <laughs> our focus now is very much on keeping inflation close to the target. There's going to be some fluctuations. There, there inevitably will be some month-to-month -month fluctuations. We're focused on keeping it uh, close to the middle of the one to three percent range. So, uh, <laughs> you know, what does that mean? It means as the upward forces on inflation ease, we need demand to strengthen, take up the slack. In terms of the data, we're going to be particularly looking, uh, focused on uh, between now and December. Uh, look, I think it's both inflation and growth. Uh, we're going to, you know, we're going to get the third quarter national accounts. We're going to get a couple of employment reports. We're going to get a CPI release. Um, so we'll be looking at all that, all that data as well as any other information we receive between now and then, and we'll take our decision in December. <laughs> so those of you that were keeping score at home, no, he did not answer the question. The question was, when will you bring it down to a controllable interest rate so that it is, people will start to invest and to shop and to buy? And he said a whole meandering way through what he had already just said. 
But what was interesting is the body language, right? How he kept putting his hand across or down whenever referring to his projection or his forecast, because there is no growth coming. And the reason that they were talking, that they're talking about this is that they're hoping that they can convince you to buy a house and you're not going to buy a house because you can't afford it. You can't afford it because the cost of food and the cost of the um, interest rates are too high. But right now, what they're focused on, because they already got through September, so they're in their market, in their minds, the next time the real push for housing doesn't come until the spring. However, what they are worried about is Christmas, which I find ironic because you run around telling the whole world that, you know, you don't care about your religion. And then all of a sudden you're like, wait a second. It seems that our Judeo-Christian uh, society is rooted a lot in this kind of um, crass commercialism as my family members would refer to it and here you are banking literally on whether or not people spend any money for Christmas and if you really want to get the economy back to the way it was if you really want to send these people a message that you know what you're doing that you know what they are doing you should figure out a way to make everybody happy at Christmas without gifts you should figure out a way to write each other stories or to knit something or to do it where you're not investing in huge amounts of money into the economy economic processes that these these guys are hoping for because he asked them when are they going to be a non-restrictive uh, interest rate and he didn't answer the question but he did tell you that he's worried about housing he's worried about how much money are spending he's worried about jobs that are the market is soft and he won't make another decision on the economy on the interest rate until he sees what the december numbers look like until he sees how much money was invested into the economy for christmas and then it won't be again right i mean it's historically that january is a slow month so there, he's then he's he's handcuffed for any projections right into the spring till people start spending again into into March. And the, to be honest with you, I'm sure they're quite nervous. I'm sure that they have a lot of money on the line in some parts in aspects of the society. And the only thing that can happen for me and you is that everything will become less expensive. Unfortunately for me and you, what what n might not necessarily become less expensive throughout the summer through the winter time, excuse me, is food and renting. Now they have a problem with renting because they have locked these people in to buy these massive um, buildings who then turn around and remortgage those buildings. And now they're locked in at this ridiculous rate. So they can't even really bring the price down. Whereas a new person coming in can sort of build a, uh, a unit and make as much profit by giving it to you less expensively, which of course is really where the problem to unravel this problem for the 99% must begin. It must begin with offering them less place, expensive places to live. By giving them less expensive places to live, they can have more money to spend. And by having more money to spend, they will generate the economy. However, they might not be able to funnel the, the money to the top that way, right? Because that's the, the issue that they have. The middle class keeps the money inside of the middle. And maybe they send a little bit up to the top. But I mean, they, 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 are, they are an economy onto themselves. And I suppose these virtue single signaling far left individuals should have thought of that instead of just getting this urge and this desire to be fascist and totalitarian in their approach to everything but again i digress i suppose that's another video overall what you can say for certain is if you stop spending on mass they will start to sit up and take notice one of the reasons that they got away with it on this far was because there was so much money, people weren't really, really missing it. Now they're starting to tighten their belts. Now they saw what the inflation can do. Now they saw that they've overloaded the system. And so there's not a, a affordable places to live. People have stopped buying cars because they simply cannot afford it. People are starting to behave in a mannerism that they didn't anticipate would manifest on, across on such a large scale. We're right at a tipping point, like I said at the beginning. And the only people to blame are those at the top that allowed for this mess to happen in the first place. This is not new information. This is not something that we haven't been able to look at all the way back to Sparta. I mean, we are well aware of the economic pressures and how they happen and why they occur. We can talk about a, a 15 or 20 times throughout history that leaders have always tried to, to over inflate, over to, to print money. And it always ends up like a disaster. It always ends up in horrible condition especially for the guys at the top because now they got no more money to print and then what happens is you start to devalue things and what's going to start right out of the gate is going to be 
people are going to start devaluing the houses that they built because nobody wants to live in a high rise condominium. That's a size of a shoe box. Nobody wants that. No matter how hard they try to force it onto you, this, you simply do not want it. If people wanted that, then the, then the suburb would never have developed. The suburb would never have manifest itself. People want their own space. Even the leaders want their own space. Anyway, if you listen this long, I appreciate it. I'm going to wrap here. I'll talk to you next time.